Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Workshop 292. Um, the workshop organizers are sitting here with our wonderful panel. I'm Jane, and this is Senka. I'm going to give a quick overview of why we're here uh, in theory, and we'll talk more about it uh, throughout the panel session. And Senka is going to introduce some of our panelists, and then we'll get to the panelists and the lineup. We have until 12 o'clock and we have two sets of speakers. We'll have Q&A in between and after each uh, set of speakers. So we have six speakers from around the world. We're very excited they're here. Um, we're here to talk about universal service or universal service and access funds. Um, these funds have been around for over 20 years. Some people are not aware of that. They were originally created by regulators around the world to subsidize fixed networks, which are fiber networks that were in the ground. Some of you uh, may only be familiar with mobile networks, but there are fixed mobile and satellite networks, and originally universal service funds were meant to subsidize those fixed networks. They were developed, in fact, with some of the big telcos that deployed those networks at the time. Um, over the years, as technology has changed and new technology has emerged, particularly mobile and other uh, Wi-Fi, mobile in particular has also been subsidized. If you receive phone bills still, uh, from your providers, you may see certain universal service taxes uh, in on your bills, at least in the United States you do, and in some other countries. And you start to realize there are quite a few fees that build up. Generally, that money went into funds. Um, throughout the years, some of those funds have been very well administered. Some have been extremely corrupt. They've been used by some governments, not for the purposes for building out networks. Um, and there's been lack of accountability in some of those funds, um, meaning Providers were given the money to build out, and they didn't build out to the rural, remote, unserved, and underserved areas. If they had, we wouldn't be where we are today with about 2.6 billion offline. Now, we all recognize, um, all the speakers here in Senka and I, that building out certain places with fiber is just not doable from a geographic and um, uh, from a geographic perspective and in different territories. And this is also, I should say, an urban, rural, and remote issue. This is not just rural, remote when it comes to universal service. There are some communities that have been what's called redlined, uh, excluded from connectivity, and that's a, a whole other issue we won't get into necessarily. But the funds have been administered in, over the years generally by regulators, in some cases by ministries. Senka wrote a paper recently for APC under a certain program that is linked to the workshop um, description, and you can see some great examples of different universal service funds from around the world. We also want to give a shout out to um, A4AI, and now it's uh, called GDIP. Um, that team has done so much work, and Natalia Frodich, who's our first speaker, um, was from that team in the past, who's done research in Latin America on universal service funds. The A4AI team also at that time had done some work in Sub-Saharan Africa to posit that there were ways that you could use those funds to help um, also women and girls in connectivity, to, to connect women and girls, but also to broaden the funds. And it's something that we've both, we've all talked about is how to take those funds and distribute them to potentially internet exchange points, to community networks, which has been done in Argentina um, recently, so that there's more diversification of those funds and subsidies out to um, other areas. So we have a wonderful range of speakers from practitioners who've been in the field building networks to policy experts um, to folks that have done extreme work on how to fund networks, that's Ben. And Josephine who's worked with um, a, a group in uh, Nairobi called Tanda. It's a community network. Constantinos, who's a policy expert, and I'm going to turn it over to Senka so she can give you better bios. But we just wanted to set the stage that the idea here is that we need to think of ways to reboot these funds, to create a, a new way of uh, putting the universal service funds out there. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the session. Um, I'm going to introduce the six speakers that we will have today. Um, our first speaker is Natalia Fordich. Uh, Natalia is the director of international programs at Connect Humanity. Um, she's a licensed attorney and expert in technology and communications policy and regulatory issues with over 15 years of experience. Uh, Natalia is joining us online from, uh, from Brazil today. Um, our second speaker, Konstantinos Kamaitis, is here in the room. Um, and um, he is currently a non-resident fellow and senior researcher at the Lisbon Council. He's also a non-resident fellow with the Digital Forensics Research Lab and um, at the Atlantic's Council Democracy and Tech Initiative. 
Previously, uh, Constantino spent 10 years um, in active policy development and strategy uh, as senior director at the Internet Society, uh, and he's also a, um, an author and public speaker. Um, our third speaker is um, joining us online today. It's Ben Matranga, who is the managing partner of Connectivity Capital. Um, Connectivity Capital is a impact investment fund focused on expanding internet access in developing countries. Um, ben has nearly 20 years of experience leading private equity, venture capital, and debt investments in emerging markets. Um, like Jane said, after those first three speakers, we will have a short uh, Q&A uh, session. Um, and then we will move to the second part of the session, which will be more um, focused on specific sectors. Um, so in that, in that part, our um, well, first speaker in the second part is going to be uh, Teddy Woodhouse. Teddy is a ICT for development expert with um, almost a decade of experience in public and nonprofit sectors. Currently, um, he's the international policy manager at Ofcom, the UK communications regulator. And in this role, he's responsible for Ofcom's engagement within the ITU. Uh, I believe that Teddy is joining us from Geneva, in fact. Um, before Ofcom, Teddy was with the Alliance for Affordable Internet. Uh, like Jane said, we actually cited a lot of work from the uh, A4AI in our background paper. Um, after Teddy, we'll have Josephine Melisa, who is here with us in the room today. Uh, Josephine is a digital inclusion and transformation consultant. Uh, she's one of the pioneers of the community networks movement in Africa. Uh, currently, she's the regional policy coordinator um, for Africa um, within APC's LockNet project. Um, she also co-chairs the Africa Community Network Summit and is a member of the uh, MAG, the IGF uh, multi-stakeholder advisory group. And um, last but not least, um, we have Saul Luca de Tena here in the room. Saul has worked as a strategic program manager within technology and development, capacity building and policy advocacy for 15 years. Uh, she's the former CEO of a award-winning community-based ISP in South Africa. And currently, Saul is a connectivity solution specialist at GIGA, which is a UNICEF ITU joint initiative um, aiming to collect every school uh, in the world to the internet by 2030. Um, as you can see, we have a very diverse panel from different stakeholder groups, um, civil society, um, private sector, government, uh, UN agencies. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the discussions, and I will hand over to our first speaker, Natalia Fordic. Thank you, Sanka. Well, first of all, thank you so much to you and to Jane for organizing the session. Um, it's a pleasure to have so many of you. Well, I envy you a little bit, as I mentioned in the chat, because I would love to be in Japan. But it's so nice to see you and see some, I mean, be able to be in this panel with Teddy. I know Onika, my former colleague, uh, is also, I mean, I saw her uh, as one of the persons who would be who attend the session. So it's a real pleasure. So I have been working with connectivity issues for around 15 years. Uh, I'm currently working for Connect Humanity, which is a philanthropic fund focused on connectivity. Uh, prior to that, I was at A4AI, and as Jane has mentioned, and well, regarding the document that Jane has mentioned, that was a document that uh, was published about two years ago. And it was focused in Latin America, Latin American and Caribbean countries. Uh, in part, we, we did that in partnership with the Internet Society. And in, in that document, we came to the conclusion that, I mean, most, most of the funding of uh, universal service funds go to large operators, right? So that's a first issue here because I mean, this various types of stakeholders should be able to access these funds. 
Another issue is that uh, a lot of the times uh, the disbursement, disbursement rates are really low. So in, in the region, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and Peru had high disbursement rates. However, many of the countries either were not using it at all or were using it for other purposes such as creative accounting, right? So you use it for... Um, for other purposes other than telecom policy, for example, uh, helping the country reach certain um, federal budgetary goals like uh, surplus, right? Um, from a perspective of equity and universality, uh, as I was mentioning, there is a, a key issue on who is able to access these funds uh, not only whether they are dispersed or not, um, as Jen has, Jane has mentioned, uh, Argentina had uh, some recent changes, like about three years ago, recent uh, legal changes that actually allowed uh, community networks to access the funds. However, it just came back from the LACNIC, LACNOG meeting um, and the LAC ASP meeting with all of the stakeholders from the region. Last week, I was there talking to them and they said that, you know, this is not working that well any longer in the country. So, I mean, I don't have precise information, but that's what I heard from them, uh, from Argentinian colleagues in the meeting last week. Um, so in the US, uh, there is also um, $42 billion now to support broadband, right, to unserved and underserved communities. However, and the, the program is called BEAD, which stands for Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. However, uh, Connect Humanity, uh, the organization I'm working for, has recently together with other organizations in the U.S. has um, advocated for changes in how these funds are being uh, designed to be dispersed because um, the smaller ISPs, whenever they are trying to get access to these funds, they have to get a letter of credit of 25% of the amount plus a 25% match requirement. And a lot of times that amounts to uh, a total amount that is much higher than what they can afford. So that basically shuts them out of the program. So, and similar fears to that happen, for example, in Brazil. Brazil is going back to the Latin American examples is one of the countries that uh, actually has is a pretty famous one because it had has had a fund for literally twenty years. However, the fund was completely dormant and was being used for creative accounting purposes. However, two years ago, we uh, a, a new law was enacted in which finally. Uh, First of all, the funds can be used towards broadband because prior to that, it was only uh, phone lines, not really internet. Um, and then second, finally, we, we are advancing towards actually disbursing these funds that, have, that has, have been accumulated for so long. But then the, there are also fears related to whether all types of stakeholders will be able to access these funds or not, whether it's just like same old, right, like large operators only. Uh, just a quick uh, <coughs> overview of how that's going. Like, you know, the National Development Bank is the financial agent behind it. So right now the BNDES, which is the National Development Bank, <coughs> as the only financial agent uh, responsible for the funds. There's, there, there will be reimbursable and non-reimbursable um, lines of credit. However, the reimbursable ones are much clearer than the non-reimbursable ones. 
and precisely the smaller stakeholders like uh, community networks would be the ones that will benefit from the non-reimbursable lines. And this is actually, they're gonna finalize uh, the, the details of how that's gonna play out only next year. Uh, and well, I don't know how much more time do I have? Well, um, and well, in regards to um, community Natalia, networks, Natalia, sorry there to is interrupt you. You have about a minute. Okay. Regarding community networks, it's something that used to be not even um, known by some of the public uh, officials, in even in within the national regulator or the ministry right so over the past two three years finally there is more awareness of it and now finally there is a new working group that has been uh created uh within the national regulator i'm sorry <laughs> and i actually have a sprained ankle and i'm taking a lot of medicine and this <laughs> This is my stomach, basically. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we hope that the we hope to uh, create more awareness of this community networks through this working group that was recently created in the regulator, the national regulator. That's it for now for the first round. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Um, over to Konstantinos. Thank you, Jane. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really good to be here, and thank you very much uh, for asking me to come uh, and speak. So I would like to start by saying that I think that at least I will bring the perspective of Europe and what's happening in Europe where discussions on infrastructure have really picked up again. I think that uh, the COVID, COVID pandemic did two things. First of all, it, it made us all realize how important the internet is and made us uh, survive what was an unprecedented, a very difficult situation. But at the same time, it highlighted the need to have a conversation about infrastructure again um, and also the political need for this to happen. Um, in Europe, at least, the way the conversations about infrastructure have been taking place for over a year and a half now, unfortunately has taken a direction that is not really about how to create sustainable um, models to support infrastructure, but uh, it is done in a way that is really premised on ideas of digital sovereignty and protectionism. Um, and for those of you who might be following a little bit what, uh, what is happening in Europe, I am talking, of course, about the fair share debate, uh, which effectively is this idea that telco providers uh, need to be paid or, you know, are entitled to payment by continent application providers for the traffic that they carry. Um, it is very unfortunate that in Europe this debate has been shaped in the way that it has because it has been sensationalized and currently we're at a place where it's not really based on facts anymore but it's really purely emotional. And what I mean by that is that, you know, the, the way the story has evolved, we're even seeing um, terminology being used that is, you know, basically completely mistaken and misinformation. For instance, companies like Google and Facebook and AWS and Netflix are being referred to as large traffic generators, which is fundamentally wrong because anyone who has spent at least uh, a little bit of time in this space knows very well that the only, it's users that generate traffic. That's it. Users want to access the services that are being provided by these companies and they pay their ISPs in order to be able to access those services. So effectively what telco providers are asking is some sort of double payment. So it's really double dipping, right? So we're getting what we want out of users, but we're also going to be getting what we want out of um, those large, very large companies. Um, 
we are at a place, and actually a lot has happened in the past 12 hours, uh, in Europe at least. Um, the, it, once the debate started, and of course there was not a lot of information, because beyond the idea of give us money, there was not really a concrete plan as to how uh, this money will be calculated, what sort of measures they will be used, why USFs are not being utilized uh, or are part of the conversation. So by the time, however, everyone started engaging, uh, I cannot remember, I've been doing this for approximately 20 years, and by this I mean internet policy, and I cannot remember any other time in Europe where stakeholders that traditionally have been at opposing ends have come together in order to fight this. Because this model and this idea is really going to materially affect the way the internet works. It is going to affect the open internet. We are talking about changing here the way interconnection agreements are made. We are uh, talking about uh, minimizing and narrowing down a lot the scope of IXPs, uh, internet exchange points, which are effectively the place where interconnection happens. Uh, and we are talking about, of course, consumers and how they will be affected because somebody will need to pay for all that money that will be spent. So we, we have spent a year and a half uh, fighting the commission um, on this. Uh, there was never a proposal, there was a consultation uh, that opened up in February and ended in May. And yesterday, of all days, uh, after four months of waiting patiently, or impatiently in my case, um, the commission released its results. Of course, there is no consensus uh, about the fair share proposal. So for the time being, it's being shelved. However, we do know that there's going to be some sort, most probably, some sort of a, of a policy recommendation. We know that the Commission is not really willing to give this up uh, and that it is going to continue. And before I just wrap up, uh, a little bit of um, self, no, it's not really a self pitch, but um, because Europe did it, and that has been one of the unintended consequences, or perhaps even intentional, a lot of other jurisdictions have started picking this up. Brazil, India, South Korea, um, the Australia, somebody pinged me on Twitter, um, and many other jurisdictions, some places in the Caribbean, are starting to pick up this conversation as well. And of course, the thinking is, if Europe does it, which is a democracy, which is the biggest trading bloc, which is the third largest economy in the world, why shouldn't we do it? It must be a very good idea. It is an awful idea. And we need to resist this global trend because one of the side effects is going to be that if this thing goes through in many jurisdictions, even in one jurisdiction, we are talking about fragmenting the internet, right? So as part of that and all these concerns, uh, a coalition of global civil society organizations released a statement today um, calling out on the governments to resist such policies because of the adverse effect that they might have on users as well as the open internet. And I'll stop here and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Constantinos. And we have one more speaker. And um, I would pause it, and we might want to talk about this after Ben speaks, is, is it triple dipping? If you get money out of users, get universal service funds, and then you put a tax on people who ride on top of, well, carry your traffic for you in some instances. In any event, we're over to Ben Matranga. And um, just a shout out also to a great report that Ben and his colleague Anup uh, put together with Connect Humanity, the Internet Society, and the Association for Progressive Communications and Mozilla. Last year, there's a great report on innovative financing for all types of networks, and in particular, some of these smaller, medium-sized um, ISPs, which are both commercial and non-commercial. Ben, we are going to turn it over to you, and Ben is another online speaker. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jane, and, and uh, thank you, Senka, for allowing me to join. Um, we're excited to be here. Um, my name is Ben Matranga. Um, I'm managing partner at Connectivity Capital. Uh, Connectivity Capital is an impact investment fund, and, and, and what that means is um, we mobilize capital from the private sector uh, and work uh, by and large with um, public sector um, private partners, so these are development finance institutions, to mobilize capital to expand internet access in frontier markets. Um, so to date, we have investments in over 15 countries. Um, our focus is broadly sub-Saharan Africa uh, and parts of Asia. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's an exciting time to have this conversation because we're, you know, 
we're, meaning the global, we uh, are at a place now where we really do have all of the tools to reach 90% plus of the people on this planet with, uh, with broadband access. Um, and that's pretty you know, exciting, bold, but also limiting. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, this is not a technological problem. Um, this is not kind of physics of how we promulgate, you know, the characteristics of uh, an IP-based uh, network. This is not a question of whether we do fiber or wireless or, or what kind of mode of, of transportation of how we get data to people. Um, that will all be solved by actors on the ground that are close to the problem. Um, we really see this as a coordination and then an access to capital problem. Um, and if we can solve those two problems, um, we will see uh, access to broadband um, increase you know, in vast swaths uh, of the globe. Um, and I think I wanna break down both of those things, first coordination and then uh, access to capital. Um, and I'll start with access to capital. Um, now the way we kind of view connectivity writ large, I think one thing that is incredibly important for everyone to kind of um, accept and, and understand that something we kind of already intuitively get is that there's this idea of the dual ecosystem of connectivity is what we call. Um, and what that means is every single person has two forms of connectivity. They have one form, which is mobile, which is connected to the person, um, which is optimized for go anywhere you want. Um, you can take it on the go. It's amazing what you can do. Um, you know, when we look at migration patterns in places like Kenya and what you can do because of the mobile phone, because you can, you know, in your life, you know, even kind of call your mom on her birthday um, to send mobile money transfers, everything that's kind of those smaller data uses. Um, it's done a fantastic job over the last decade. Um, we like to call that uh, kind of the first wave of connectivity in emerging markets, um, but there's limits to that leapfrog. And the second form of connectivity, which is predominant, which we're all using right now, um, is broadband connections. And broadband for us is uncapped, always on. Um, it is thinking about the internet and thinking about the data, not as kind of some episodic thing that you do. Uh, it's just always there. Um, and when it's always there, it becomes a utility. Um, what we like to see over time is the pricing for that service no longer becomes a luxury good, but it's a commodity. You don't even think about the price to transact on it. And today in most parts of the world, for the vast majority of people, data is still a luxury good. Um, and, and our mission is basically to make a commodity everywhere in the world so people can jump online whenever they want to, interact in whatever way they uh, choose to, and then um, uh, exit and know the internet is still gonna be there when they're done. Um, now, I, I think, uh, you know, what I really want to hit the point on is kind of the challenge of blended finance and how we use blended finance with private sector partners to expand access to the internets in all of these remote parts of the world that need that uncapped always on broadband connection. Um, and I think the, the, the challenge with blended finance is less that it's needed. You know, the track record of using blended finance and universal service funds in Europe and the United States is, is pretty universal. Uh, you know, you take most sections of uh, the population and they required some, some, some form of subsidy. Uh, I think the bigger challenge in emerging markets is who pays for it and then how much blending is needed. Um, you know, the, the stark reality is in most of the countries we operate in, uh, the governments have a ton of pressure on their budgets. Um, and that's to provide for social goods and services, healthcare, uh, education, et cetera. And there's constraints on those parts. And, and it, it seems to have shaken out that providing additional subsidy for telecoms is something that is just always one of those things that is just not the, the coalition of actors there to provide that subsidy that you would have in other sectors. Um, now, the good news is that the cost to actually build these networks is, is <laughs> falling through the floor. Um, you know, kind of global supply chains have reacted um, and the cost to build a network, even a fiber-based network in most of these uh, markets is, you know, extraordinarily cheaper than it was even, you know, five years ago. Um, so less subsidy is needed. And how is that subsidy then provided for? Um, our belief is that governments may be able to provide some subsidy. Um, the exciting subsidies that we see are coming around anchor institutions. Uh, when we talk about anchor institutions, we think about these as universities, community centers, hospitals, um, uh, uh, et cetera. And that, what that does in terms of network architecture is it pulls kind of the, the what we like to think of as the trunk, the, the kind of fat part of the network, your, your backhaul distribution into new places. Um, and it just lowers the landed cost of bandwidth to get into new communities. Then that kind of ground game that ISPs can build off of 
uh, it, it drops their price to then reach the uh, end consumer. So in certain markets, we're most excited about seeing uh, the potential of that. Giga has certainly uh, done that at scale in, in certain African markets. Um, once you get the landed cost of bandwidth into new communities, um, uh, by and large, ISPs um, are extraordinarily creative. They're probably you know, riding on the backbone of some of that infrastructure even before um, most of the uh, uh, public sector clients know it. They're, you know, it's extraordinarily crafty and, and kind of fast moving entrepreneurs that do that. And once they see that landed cost of bandwidth drop, they know their economics well enough that they can deliver that service um, to end consumers. Um, now, the second part of that question is, is uh, who? And I think, you know, building a broadband network really comes down to what we like to think of as revenue density. Um, it's just the cost to serve denser populations is always going to be less. Um, and that's how, um, you know, it's, it's kind of always been the case. Uh, and that's where kind of the need for thoughtful public policy of how we uh, think about the amount of subsidy that's needed to reach some of those lesser dense uh, population comes into play. Um, the good news is, I think, in emerging markets, we're not kind of even there yet. Uh, you know, there's still a lot of runway to move uh, with private sector builds in these in in, in most of uh, these markets. You know, you, you take um, you take a country, even like South Africa, for all intents and purposes, uh, uh, you know, feels well developed is a brick is you know kind of you know, solid second world country, still has broadband uh, penetration rates. Uh, that are just around 15%, right? So there's just a lot of movement to go to get an uncapped always on connection in everyone's home. Um, I think what's critical for us, and I think uh, I just wanna end on this point, um, and this is something that uh, A4AI, uh, the Alliance for Affordable Internet really hit on early on around the, the, the importance of meaningful connectivity is, you know, what is broadband and why is it important? And uh, you know, the pandemic certainly hit that uh, home for a lot of us. Um, you, know, you can't, you're only gonna use a sliver of the internet if you um, have episodic data use. You're certainly not gonna have a call like this um, and be on, you know, we'll be on this call an hour and a half, that'll consume about a gig and a half of data. Um, so uh, just as an example of real time for people that want to uh, be able to participate, you do need that uncapped always on connection. Uh, we think that's kind of the, the way what customers will demand in these markets. With that, I'll, let me send it back over to Jane and, and Senka. Thank you, Ben. And I should have said earlier when we started, thank you to the host country. The connectivity here has been amazing. So thank you to the <laughs> to our, our hosts here in Japan as well. And, and we're very lucky, as Ben said, that we can have this uh, call. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and we've just heard from Ben, Constantinos and Natalia. There's a theme we could pull out on subsidization and public policy, and I would say multi-stakeholder participation in <laughs> policy making, because Ben, you as a, a finance expert, certainly um, could, not only are you helping subsidize networks, but you're working with governments and public sector organizations to help them flip the policy so it's not just them making the decisions without talking to um, experts. Um, I would ask you all, and Constantinos was just talking about Europe, um, subsidization of, of connectivity has been going on a very long time, and especially some of the biggest, uh, biggest networks in the world, the biggest ISPs. You know, why wouldn't we want a, a strong public policy, uh, multi-stakeholder consultation? Um, to shape those policies, to either develop funds, to have the right public policies put in place. Natalia, I'll start with you because uh, uh, um, Connect Humanity is doing great work in starting up funds to also work with the pu pu public policy folks. And you've recently, as you noted, put something out on the letter of credit in the United States. And or you're in Brazil yourself and you're an expert in that space. And from A4AI in general, talk to us about, and we'll give it a minute each, talk to us about what you think can be done um, to improve multi-stakeholder consultation on some of these really critical issues, particularly USFs, um, Ben, when it comes to just financing in general, and Constantinos, um, how this relates to fair share and the subsidization as well. So Natalia, over to you. Well, Regarding the fair share, I'm also following that closely. Um, I'm following the debate closely, as Constantino has mentioned. It, it has become a really strong uh, topic in Brazil, too. We recently had a consultation from the national regulator. 
um, now they are there. There are um, rumors that they will propose that big techs contribute to the U.S. staff too, as like one potential solution for that ordeal. Um, and then, in regards to the um, consultations. Um, well, one of the fears that um, smaller ISPs in Brazil have is that the money was is not going to be dispersed at a fast enough pace, um, and uh, whether the they are actually going to be able to access them or not. Right, like they we should have more participation and the design itself of the details of how the money will be disbursed, which is not, I mean, there is some uh, multi-stakeholder participation, but it's limited to particular institutions that are part of a established group, an official group, but not all stakeholders are represented there, right? Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the universal service funds. Uh, now um, and as and also there are issues uh, with double or triple dipping as you might have mentioned uh, potential overlaps in incentives right that the large companies get so for example like we had recently the 5g spectrum uh, auction and it was actually auction at a, a lower price and now they have uh, the large operators that actually got the spectrum have to cover schools however they are also getting uh, public funds from the universal service funds to connect the schools right so that is an issue and for that particular type of example we need uh, a stronger public involvement and involvement from different stakeholders to make sure that you know there's more transparency and actually the funds are actually used and not there's like not double or triple dipping in this funds that's it thank you natalia and you've hit on something that i'll segue over to constantino san for years and years and years we all talked about best practices in public um consultations which is transparency uh publishing the different um uh proceeding results that you've got. So if you've um, you've contributed to the proceeding and then working with a, a large range of stakeholders so that you can hopefully have a better policy in place. Constantinos, have you seen that recently? <laughs> uh, short answer, yes. So to me, it, was, it has been quite a remarkable experience, especially Europe has been quite a remarkable experience in the way this has been handled uh, because we did have a public uh, consultation process. FYI, this was an exploratory consultation, meaning that it is a tool that the Commission uses in order to be able to identify whether there is actually an issue before they proceed to actual drafting of legislation. And according to its own toolbox, the Commission's own toolbox, if the, the, uh, the consultation, the exploratory consultation comes back, you know, and they're against it, they should not really proceed uh, with legislation. So all that was, you know, there was a little bit of a hazy uh, moment in Europe because we really did not understand what is happening and why this is happening. But even beyond that, I just want to, to make a couple of points here. Um, the first one is that there is not a clear policy objective why we're doing this, especially in Europe. Uh, connectivity issues in Europe are not as, of course, there are connectivity issues, but in terms of um, fiber, uh, we are actually meeting the targets. In, f in terms of 5G coverage, we're al actually meeting the targets in Europe. And also there has been a study by WIC Consultancy on behalf of the Commission in the European Union that actually said that even though these targets are met, consumers are not using them, they're not making use of these services because they don't know they exist, they haven't seen the utility yet, and so on and so forth. So we are at a place where we are actually meeting those targets. The second point that I want to make is that um, telcos are making money, 
right? I mean, it's not that they're not making money. The question here is, and the policy seems to be, and that was always an issue for me, uh, and a question that has never been answered, uh, the policy always seemed to be to try to make big telcos, because we're all, all only talking about big telcos in Europe, as big as big tech. Right, and I do appreciate that in the internet environment, telcos might uh, not be as big as big technology companies, but that is their issue to solve. This is not a public policy issue that requires regulatory intervention. The other thing that I want to make is about the diversity of infrastructure and the point that the commission seems to be missing. When it comes to the internet, one of the things that, one of the most basic rules is that no network is more important than another. And what the Commission seems to be implying is that access networks seems to have some sort of priority and privilege over other networks. We know that when it comes to internet infrastructure, it is extremely diverse and everybody contributes their own share. What do I mean? Telcos invest in upgrading their networks. Technology companies invest in creating CDNs and data centers in order to be able to facilitate the traffic and make sure that users get access to the content that they want and the services that they want in a much faster and more reliable way. Um, in fact, the OECD is working on a report and they will be coming out uh, that most probably will be coming out next month where it makes exactly that point about broadband infrastructure. It, it tries to demonstrate the, the, the diverse set of actors that are participating. And the report will identify, of course, telecom providers, of course, big technology companies, but then you have tower companies, you have hedge funds, you have pension funds, you have municipalities, that they're all being part of this infrastructure ecosystem. So it is very important, and I, I will keep on repeating this because I believe that it gets missed in all this noise. We need to talk about infrastructure, right? Our reliance on the internet will only increase. But pitting technology companies against telcos is not the way to do this. The only way to do this is to collaborate, and only to collaborate. USFs might provide that framework to collaborate, and yes, we need to change a lot of things, I heard transparency, the, the word transparency being thrown out, definitely transparency. We have a mechanism, in some cases it has worked, the USFs, in some other cases it may not have worked. Let's all work together in, a, in order to try to figure out how to strengthen it, boost it, and actually facilitate this infrastructure building. Thank you, Konstantinos and Ben, sort of riffing off that theme of collaboration, but in a different way, in a financial collaborative sense of universal service funds being part of a capital stack for investment. Can you just pull a little bit on that a little bit more and why that is part of a potential blended finance um, stack? So over to Ben. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. And I think you know the, the reality is that universal service funds are, um, it, it, most governments in the world utilize them. So it's a pot of capital that it, it just exists in, in most of uh, the markets, uh, even kind of lo the lowest end countries that we uh, finance projects in. So it's, you know, the money's there. Um, the challenge is, is always how does it get out to the end users? And I would uh, plug just one more time the report that Jay mentioned. We wrote a report uh, with APC Connect Humanity um, with I I ISOC. Uh, and uh, around financing mechanisms. And one of the things that we really highlighted was getting in the weeds of what a subsidy looks like. Um, and the real importance with subsidies is understanding what we would in finance call the difference between capital expenditure and operational expenditure, but it's really kind of what is the one time versus the ongoing costs of subsidy. Um, when you're doing subsidy uh, type programs, the ongoing costs are the ones that just, they tend to be tougher um, because do they go on in perpetuity? When do they uh, when do they expire? Essentially, uh, whereas the one-time costs, you can really get your head around uh, right at the build. Um, the great thing about one-time costs is uh, you can drastically lower that number when you have coordinated billings uh, bill, uh, built. Um, right, so the cost to actually build uh, uh, multiple different areas when you're doing it at once, when you're doing it up front, um, is actually quite a bit cheaper. Uh, what we call truck rolls, bringing out a crew, mobilizing resources to, to continue builds uh, after the fact, um, it can be extraordinarily expensive. 
Now, I think the key with capital, with CapEx, is kind of understanding what types of numbers we're talking about. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. We just put out two loans, one in uh, South Africa, where we look at the core CapEx of a, a network. Um, we're putting that out at about $80 per user. That's 80 US dollars per user to provide core network CapEx to build out um, in these markets. You know, the subsidy needn't, meet, needn't be very large. Um, you know, we're talking kind of in the range of 10 to 20% is uh, typically what was done in the United States. Um, you know, so in a situation like that, we're, you know, we're talking $20 a user um, to be able to bring broadband services. Um, in India, it's even less. Um, and in India, they're doing fiber at such tremendous scale. So this is durable, uh, long dated infrastructure that is um, in the ground that'll exist in perpetuity. Um, I think the last point I would just make is, um, understanding the difference, and this is where public policy really is, is needed and is challenging, um, is how you divide different geographic areas. Um, the way we typically think about any given geographic area is it falls into one of, uh, one of four economic buckets. Uh, one of them is that they're great economics, solid returns. The other one is there's marginal economics. The other one is there's insufficient economics. And the other one is there's permanent subsidy that's required. Um, the ones that are solid economics are by and large are being serviced. The telcos are already there. They're there at scale. Um, with great public policy environment, there's competition that bids down pricing. Uh, those are by and large solving themselves. And no one would be surprised if you looked at the, the, the maps of those. It's in the CBD. It's in the highest, most populated uh, uh, parts. The second phase, which is the marginal economics, by and large, the builds are happening. Um, it, it's the longer duration capital that really constrains those from being built. Uh, the way capital formation works in most emerging markets is long-term dated uh, uh, capital, um, and especially in high inflation environments like we're in now, it, it does uh, uh, kind of constrict the ability to build uh, to some of those projects. And that's where um, you know, mechanisms of international finance that are still private sector led can, can really uh, increase uh, the build there. Uh, the next bucket, marginal economics, that's where you do need USFs to come in. Um, and those are communities that are uh, you know, predominantly impoverished, uh, you know, a whole host of, of uh, kind of uh, uh, other challenges. But by and large, that um, if you can get that subject in there, you can build out to those places. And I think the smartest uh, subsidy programs that we're seeing are focused on those areas. The last one, which is kind of insufficient economics, uh, part of that is just deep rural remote areas. Um, and, you know, I think the, the good news is as a percentage basis, those are almost always single digits in any given country. Um, so there's kind of a, a, a needed discussion about permanent forms of subsidy that's needed, um, but it's, it includes that both one time and ongoing subsidy. Thank you, Ben. And I would throw in, if we're gonna have permanent subsidies, um, midterm, short-term, long-term, we're gonna need a little bit more accountability in some countries where if a provider is given a certain amount of subsidization, it would be good to know um, what they actually did with that money and if people were actually connected. Um, there's some great universal service programs out there. We're gonna hear a little bit more about that and that's a good segue over to Teddy. So the next set of panelists are Teddy Woodhouse, Josephine Meliza, and Sol Luca de Tena. So Teddy, over to you. Teddy's coming to us from Geneva. And thank you to Teddy and Ben, because it's very late where they both are, and Natalia. Um, and we appreciate your um, being so uh, fresh and giving us great data um, at a tough hour. So Teddy, over to you. You're in Geneva. We appreciate that. And you're with Ofcom, the UK regulator, for those that may not be familiar with Ofcom. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jane. And hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be joining you all, no matter what time zone it is. Um, it is worth the effort. Um, so yeah, as Jane mentioned, I'm at Ofcom, the UK regulator. And so I, I wanted to focus a bit on what the regulator's role in trying to achieve universal service and what that looks like. Um, because there's, there's some nuance to what a public policy role is and what a regulator's role is going to be. And so uh, focusing in on that regulator role which is the stuff I love. Um, hopefully we can get into that. Um, in the UK's experience, um, one of the key nuances that uh, defines the UK market is we have a universal service obligation rather than a universal service fund. Um, and so what that means is it's actually implemented um, that there's an obligation on two providers in the UK, um, BT and KCOM, which are kind of 
chosen by geography um, who have an obligation to provide universal service to broadband in certain geographic areas they're assigned to, rather than necessarily there's a central fund that disperses the funds out to um, you know, other service providers or how, have, how you have it. Um, the way the obligation works in the UK, just to briefly describe it, is kind of uh, created in 2018 through legislation. And then 2019, Ofcom creates the implementing forces um, as the regulator of what are the expectations of this. And this has expectations around the speeds. Um, there's a kind of minimum definition, definition there. Um, and then also kind of naming who, who this obligation will sit on. Um, and so the way it works is for, for a user is if they don't have a decent broadband connection at home, they can request to either BT or KCOM, depending on where in the country they live, um, for coverage to be provided to them. Um, they have to, if coverage gets provided to them, they pay no more than what an average commercial consumer would pay. Um, and, but the build of up to, uh, right now it's 3,400 pounds um, gets covered. If it's more than that, unfortunately, and for some truly remote and rural parts of uh, the UK, um, it's going to be too, it's more than that. And so then there has to be a question of, okay, how does that excess get paid for, whether it's by the consumer or other public financing mechanisms that exist in the UK. Um, and that's where it kind of then starts to lean in to the government work that um, can happen in this sector. So it's a brief description of how the universal service obligation works in the UK. And so that's one model of approaching this question of how do we connect everyone in the world? Um, some of the other parts that are live in the UK network uh, UK uh, market that are going to be relevant to how we understand this issue are things like the shared rural network, um, which is a kind of agreement essentially between the UK government and network operators here, mobile network operators here in the UK to build out into rural areas set by to targets that are mo monitored by Ofcom, the regulator. And so that's the regulator's role is actually this kind of transparency and enforcement role of making sure that what gets agreed to and what the expectations are in terms of rural coverage are being met. Um, and it's important here to think about the driver that's the benefit of having four major operators all working together on this uh, program is you have the prospect for competition, which can be a really thorny issue when you're trying to think about universal service in rural areas and feel like if you get coverage of any kind, um, it's great, but then it's oh, but there's only just one. So now you're creating the conditions for a monopoly and how do you address that um, by design is also an interesting question when we think about universal service. Um, another program that's um, in the UK and this one is operated by Ofcom is the social tariffs program. Um, and so this one works with fixed broadband where essentially Ofcom, the regulator has negotiated with uh, broadband providers throughout the UK on creating a specific tier of broadband packages that are more affordable, targeted towards low income households. So if someone is on universal credit here in the UK or receives another type of public benefit, um, they become eligible for this program. Um, and it again has expectations of minimum speeds and performance for this network so that people are still getting a good user experience. Um, even in these conditions where you're trying to use kind of a public intervention to provide connectivity. Um, and so I'll stop there just because I also want to hear from the other two panelists um, personally. I, I think they're going to be incredible and they're also in site, on site. So that's much more interesting. Um, so, but what I'll just say is from the UK experience, some of the things that I hope are kind of the transferable lessons that make sense are things about you have to have a role of different stakeholders and particularly a role between the regulator and industry is really important. Um, the universal service obligation, for example, was designed so it was actually an application basis. So BT and KCOM come forward and said, we want to provide and feel we can meet the obligation in these areas. And so that was something that was done at an earlier stage so that it works for consumers at the later stage when they're requesting access. Um, it's also about analyzing the market and this builds a bit into you know ben's four categories of economic investment here is um, things like this the shared rural network here in the uk builds out of you know what is feasible with just no interventions and doesn't need something but what are the where are the areas in the country where we do need to intervene and do need to kind of set targets and the last part is about kind of adapting and iterating as you go through 
Um, and so this is actually going to be one of the upcoming issues for the UK is um, what are expectations around speed and performance and if we need to revise the universal service definition of broadband. So currently it's uh, 10 megabits per second um, is the minimum download speed. Does that need to increase to a higher number um, potentially in the future? And so that's hopefully just a few examples um, and kind of bits of um, wisdom that we can share from the UK experience. Um, but I'll hand over to my other panelists and thank everyone for their time. Thank you, Teddy. And you gave us a lovely segue there with the point that you just made um, on adapting and iterating. I had experiences years ago where I worked with regulators who thought the rules went in place and things didn't need to change. <laughs> and of course, with new technology coming on and new types of networks being deployed and new ways to subsidize those networks or help capitalize them, in Ben's case and others, um, it really is important that we look at regulatory flexibility, and I think many people will call it fit for purpose regulation, which has to change over time. Josephine, I know in Kenya, there's been some um, really great work being done um, with the regulator. I know that from a community networks perspective, you have perspectives on universal service. We're turning it over to you now to hear a little bit more from your perspective and from your on the ground perspective. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jen, and to my other panelists as well. I think I'd just like to start uh, by setting a, a context around USS in Africa uh, in general, is that um, currently uh, 37 countries have been able to establish a USF. Um, some are still in progress, and with regards to how they are set up, there's those that are independent, um, sort of independent agencies, uh, and others are housed within um, the regulator. And I think similar to other continents as well, there still make gross challenges around dormancy in as much as many of them are established not at the funds and not dispersed. Uh, we have issues around um, transparency, impact and sustainability of some of the projects that uh, the USFs undertake. So for example, you'd find that uh, in some countries they'll set up uh, infrastructure but uh, there's no ownership of that infrastructure beyond those funds. Um, some uh, undertake projects such as setting up uh, digital ICT centers, which after they're handed over to uh, the communities, there's no follow-up, and so you find that uh, this lies dormant. Um, and so um, in trying to you know, unlock USFs, um, especially for community networks, it really begins at first understanding that majority of our African countries do not recognize community networks as complementary access models. And so this means that automatically you are locked out uh, from accessing these funds. Uh, Kenya is an example where uh, there has been good collaboration uh, between the regulator and civil society organizations. Uh, in 2020, uh, during the pandemic, I think the silver lining was that we realized that in as much as we are talking about these um, technologies such as AI, IoT, uh, we really had a huge uh, percentage of our population which is still unconnected. And so as part of the COVID-19 responses, the government looked at how it can be able to support last mile connectivity. And so um, together with APC and Kicktanet, uh, with support from the UK government, uh, we started looking at how can community networks um, be licensed or introduced into the telecommunications uh, market structure. And this resulted into uh, the development of a community networks uh, service provider license, uh, which um, addressed the issues around affordability. Um, because um, at uh, $50 um, as an annual operating fees is quite affordable for uh, community-based organizations or NGOs that would like to start and operate uh, community networks. Um, and it came at a good time because uh, 2021 was just the end of the cycle for the USF strategic plan in Kenya. And so at that time, we began now engaging on how then can community networks be able to benefit uh, from, uh, from the USF. So one of the uh, issues that came up was that um, for you to access USF, you also had to contribute 
uh, to the USF and the license for community networks exempted uh, community networks from contributing to the USF. So one of the arguments that came up was that since community networks do not contribute to the USF, they should not be able to benefit uh, 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 from the USF. And so together again, providing our technical assistance and contributions to the USF process, um, um, engagements with the local community networks, we were able to advocate for the removal of that clause. Um, and so in 20, uh, within the draft framework, 2022, 2026, um, the regulator looks to uh, establish 100 uh, community networks, uh, which I think was, was a great milestone. Um, uh, in terms of the wins for community networks. And this really helped in terms of our advocacy across the continent because at least now we have a reference point with other regulators. Uh, and last year we had the Malawi regulator visit uh, the Kenya regulator just for an exchange. Um, and from that now within the Malawi um, strategic plan, they are now looking to support uh, community broadband networks. So for them, it's not community networks, but community broadband networks. But even beyond Kenya, we've also seen success in Zimbabwe as well, where there's that close collaboration between uh, the community network there, which is Murambinda, and Potras, which is the, which is the regulator. So what is the role of CSOs? I think first is raising awareness. Our regulators still are not aware of uh, community networks. There's still a lot of misconceptions around what community networks are and what they're not. Um, and so there's need for that um, um, raising awareness, capacity building uh, as well. We've had workshops together with the ITU um, in, in Kenya, Nigeria, and Cameroon, also just to raise awareness around the licensing framework and also how USFs uh, can be able to support uh, community networks. Kenya, for example, even though we have a license and within the framework of the strategic plan, they'd like to support community networks, the regulator still does not understand how that is going to happen. So beyond that, we, there's still need for hand-holding as to how we can be able now to you know, structure it, uh, you know, how much does a community network need, how much funds can they absorb what is feasible. And beyond that, I think, is also the providing technical assistance where uh, resources are available. Wow, shout out to the multi-stakeholder model and working with the Kenyan regulator and also just this good news about Malawi, Zim, Nigeria, and Cameroon. This is exciting. Um, and there are wonderful regulators like Teddy and the people that Josephine's working with in Kenya and some of these other countries. So this is a, a really interesting ecosystem of work that has to happen, um, and it's not done overnight. <laughs> Um, Sol, Luca de Tena, we're going to turn it over to you for a perspective from an intergovernmental organization and also from your personal experience. Thank you very much, uh, Jane and Senken. I, I really appreciate the, the richness of experience and knowledge in this panel. Uh, two points that um, other panelists have highlighted and I keep hearing repeated throughout the IGF um, that really pertain to essentially reaching this internet for all are the need for more transparency, and the need for different stakeholders to be involved and informed um, yeah, to attain digital inclusion. I want to share it with you what we're doing in GIGA um, that speaks to these two points and, and also um, go a little bit deeper into one of the success cases. So initially, oh, essentially, GIGA is a global initiative by two UN agencies. We have uh, UNICEF and ITU. Uh, focused on connecting um, all the schools in the world by 2030. And now I think it's really important to understand here schools as a marker of community, or as Ben mentioned, as an anchor of community. Um, often not only for access, but also to access digital literacy and tools. Um, they also function as hubs during social um, services or shelters in times of disaster and emergencies. So. To better understand the unique position of intergovernmental uh, stakeholders, let me just explain how, I mean, from GIGA's perspective, we are leveraging UNICEF's presence in 190 countries, decades of a wealth of uh, know-how, working with critical issues with children, youth, and education, and of course, ITU's unique position within the telecommunications sector across the world. 
So together we, um, we work with the Ministry of Education on one side, the Ministry of ICT, private sector and civil society organizations. But okay, what do we do and how can we help revitalize USF? Uh, GIGA works in the access layer of the digital divide, essentially developing open source tools that create a common language, evidence, and bring toge together best, best practices. We do this with three main areas of work, uh, advocacy, technical assistance, uh, and procurement. If you can see my slide here, um, yes, I'm also, everyone's highlighting Brazil somehow, it's a good example. <laughs> so what you see in front of you is um, every dot represents a school, so roughly 138,000 schools, and their color indicates the connectivity status. Green dots are good connectivity, red dots are no connectivity, uh, and this data gets updated every four hours. We're also working on the um, yellow dot, which is whether it's enough or not. So using this map, I want to just uh, go over the three areas of work that we have, right? Um, in many cases, um, uh, stakeholders don't hold the same information and don't understand the same information. And this map shows very quickly where the need lies and how large the need is. So I'm going to refer back to the, um, the Brazil case that uh, Natalia mentioned where UNICEF joined, uh, UNICEF Brazil and GIGA joined forces to advocate for this reform of the USF. And from 2020 to 2022, eventually um, succeeded in this reform of, as I don't know if Natalia mentioned, but it was a $24 billion uh, accumulation over 20 years of funds. Essentially, these changes did lead, at least at some level, right, to improve focus and mechanism for dispersing the funds, um, reducing regional inequalities, and as pertains to our focus, right, and locking um, this uh, commitment to connecting schools. And this translates into about $675 million for school connectivity, which is about 18% of the annual fund. In technical assistance, I wanted to highlight, firstly, this map knowing what the state of um, connectivity is. GIGA has mapped 2.1 million schools in 138 countries. Um, in some cases, uh, no gov the governments don't have full um, databases of these uh, schools. So we are using machine learning AI to identify schools as well. And to date, this has just uh, been started. We've mapped uh, 20,000 new schools in eight countries. Then understanding connectivity status. Um, we've developed together with Ericsson and MLab a um, user device app that sends measurements through and there are about 80,000 schools reporting connectivity status near real time. But we're also going further, right, to understand from an ISP's perspective what their quality of service is or just what their status is. And we're working with several ISPs currently who are sharing their network data. And so in triangulating that experience and quality, we're really getting a sense of what the connectivity re reality is. There's also other tools for improvement of procurement and management of public uh, connectivity contracts, which for many governments is very complex. So briefly, connectivity credits is a way to incentivize connecting um, the difficult areas or the high-risk areas, you know, technically or financially, I think Teddy mentioned, uh, went into that quite well. Um, and Giga Counts would also, it's another project to support um, the management of high volumes of contracts. Lastly, in procurement. So initially Giga connected five and a half thousand schools in 20 countries, just creating a basis for better procurement practices. And now it's focused on procurement recommendations, templates, assistance um, to support more efficient co school connectivity. I want to mention two brief um, examples. So in Kyrgyzstan, together with the Ministry of Education, um, the contracting was able to reduce costs of connectivity by 43%, uh, representing about a saving of $250,000 uh, per, per year. And in Rwanda, um, it was able to also catalyze a cost decrease by 55%, so from $20 uh, per Mbps to nine, um, and improve the speeds by 400%, so from 5 to 25 Mbps. 
Um, further to that, Giga um, helps to unlock more and, and has helped so far to unlock $1.7 billion uh, for financing school uh, connectivity in a blended format. Um, and it, in addition to the, um, the case in Brazil that I mentioned earlier, I've also been able to um, help unlock $5 million um, dollars for a loan for Sierra Leone and $100 million for Niger. So, and, and these different uh, areas of work support one another. So if you, USF are to be effectively revitalized, I think what our work focuses on and what I think is imperative is that we look at the life cycle, right? That we look at coordinated planning, um, that we look at a deployment and monitoring of, you know, is the fun, I mean, are they connected? Are they staying connected? And yeah, we hope that Giga can help with this. Thank you. Thank you, Sol. This is uh, exciting work that the um, the two UN agencies are doing with, um, as Sol indicated, of course, with the regulators, policymakers, and others, to help you know bring about change in how connectivity is being um, distributed, but also financed. Um, we do have some online questions. We'll turn to our online moderator in a minute. We'll each we'll ask each participant that just was in this other block, Teddy, Josephine, and Sol, a question, and then we'll open it up, of course, to the floor here in um, Kyoto, but also on the online floor. Teddy, one quick question for you. Has Ofcom um, provided universal service funding to community-based networks or municipal networks or whatever the correct terminology is in the UK? Uh, thanks, Jane. Um, so yeah, so um, when we talk about universal service programs, it's not so much that Ofcom is providing the funding ourselves. We kind of see our role as you know, creating the market conditions for network providers to exist. And so when we think about, um, you know, community networks or altnets, um, as they're called here in the UK, what it is, it's about creating market conditions so that communication providers of all variety of types can succeed. Um, so in part, that's going to be aspects about having um, a regulatory framework that is simple enough that you know, anyone can do it, no matter whether they have a huge legal team behind them or if they're a really small operation. Um, but also, you know, looking at other aspects of how, you know, market competitors work with each other and so uh, to, you know, provide internet services throughout the country. And so that relates a lot to how we understand, you know, whole, wholesale services and the kind of separation of BT from open reach and how that process has been managed from a regulatory perspective because it's, you know, BT being a retail operator and then OpenReach being kind of more of an access network that other networks can then build onto and provide access in new areas. Um, that relationship is really important to making sure it's working correctly so that you have a competitive and diverse market of different uh, providers because what we're having um, as a really positive experience in the UK is this diversity of market players. Um, hopefully in part because of Ofcom's role, but there's other aspects at play as well um, that you know enable consumers to have a good and affordable experience in terms of broadband services. And thank you, Teddy. That is that important differential between the fact that you're not dispersing funds, you have an obligation, and you're looking at those market conditions, which is great from that regulatory perspective. I think it's in sharp contrast to <laughs> what Constantino has, has experienced recently. Um, Josephine, on setting the stage and working with regulators, what would your advice be to CSOs that do want to interface and work with regulators and help influence policy? Because for those in the room that have done this, uh, I'm looking at Eric Huerta, who's in the room as well, from uh, Redis, and Carlos Baca, Sol, and others. It can be tricky if you're not experienced in working with government. So what would you suggest, Josephine? Um, I think in our, in our case, a lot of, um, I would say, patience. <laughs> First, <laughs> like <laughs> uh, patience, because um, an experience that we had in 2019 uh, with uh, with one of my colleagues was that uh, as we were trying to get in, just having meetings with the with the regulators, uh, the doors keep be, uh, were just like <laughs> being slammed on us. Uh, but I would say 2020 was when things began to shift. So. Um, and Jen, you were with us, I think, since 2017, uh, 2016, 2017. So it's first, I would say, patience. So it's not a <laughs> uh, patience and resilience. Uh, but I 
also think, as you, you mentioned something, that it's an ecosystem uh, type of advocacy. Uh, in our case, uh, we really uh, built on the collaboration that was existing uh, between the UK Digital Access Program with the regulator in Kenya. Um, and so that helped in terms of one, building sustainability into some of the programs that they support. Because if there's no policy change, then even if you're building capacity or you're building networks, then there's no sustainability to that. So I would say also looking at who else in the ecosystem has those types of relationships and can be able to introduce you or bring you into the room because they have a sort of um, validity yeah, we can see like even our collaboration with the ITU, for example, uh, also helps us in terms of, of those advocacy efforts. Um, and also there's no need to recreate uh, what is already existing. Um, so in our, in our interventions, for example, we also built on a lot of experience uh, from other countries and other regions as well. So these resources exist. Um, so more partnerships and collaborations uh, with uh, ex other existing uh, players or stakeholders within the ecosystem. That's awesome, and thank you. That's a shout out to FCDO as well, who you worked with closely in ITU and Go UK. You guys are you know, two for two here. Um, and also, um, your point about data, getting those case studies out there, and segueing over to you, Sol, on the data side. Um, help us uh, with some of the sort of insight you have on, on what Giga, you think Giga could do more in the future of working with um, countries to, to highlight the importance of that ecosystem and funding and data. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, I mean, ecosystem, I really also appreciate Josephine's mention of you know, the need for different stakeholders, um, also gathering e experience, right? Um, and I think that that's the, that's the privilege that we are in the position to have, right? With these two different agencies that pull on already existing relationships with at least two ministries, already creates a channel of communication. And I think we are working more on that, and I think we can work more. Um, and I think uh, I go back to my struggle, um, not only now, but also uh, previously in my life as a community network <laughs> practitioner, um, around creating a common language. And uh, you know, that's not just between government, private sector, and civil society, which we know, <laughs> you know kind of are driven by different things and, and, and speak to the same issues in different ways, but also between gov uh, government departments, right? Different uh, foci and, and different ways to explain or different, um, I, I suppose, challenges. So. I think Giga is in a very good position to create, uh, I think, I hope the, the map illustrated, you know, the kind of simple tools of trying to understand the same problem, trying to understand that based on facts and evidence and cases. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that what we can definitely bring to the table is a common language, um, not only across different uh, departments in, in public sector, which are our natural, um, interlocutors, but also with uh, public, uh, sorry, private and, and community-based organizations. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. We have about 12 minutes for some Q&A. Um, is there anyone, I think there was a question, um, let me give Carlos a microphone. Carlos, was there a question online? Is, is there anyone in the room? Uh, that would have, oh, Eric, okay. So we have two questions in the room and we did have a question online, I think. Oh, good. We have three questions, okay. And yeah. could we just say, good, if you could um, ask concise questions so we can give like a minute of an answer so we can get everybody in, thank you. Well, um, regarding the GIGA project, um, says that help to download the cost of the schools in some country. Can you explain a bit more how did that happens? And also, they mentioned um, this uh, tool for global or big contracts. No? So one of the challenges and some of the difficulties is uh, um, 
that, uh, that the government usually do all those big contracts, but there are sometimes uh, small providers in close to the communities that uh, can bring different costs or uh, cheaper costs or better access to those schools. So I know how is this um, dealing with this. And, um, yeah, well, and the other was with the, with the first uh, <laughs> questions. Um, um, it, the model of, um, yeah, I mean, there, there has a lot of complaints about the concentrations of these uh, platforms. And uh, I think it's not only affected the carriers, but also it's affecting the, the content creators and such as. Um, do you think in, in a, or what would be the ideas to, to change this or sort of uh, uh, allowing to spread more, uh, to spread the, uh, the money they get instead of the concentration they already have? Hello, everyone um, from civil society in Paraguay. Perhaps a question for Josephine and uh, Natalia, I, I think. Um, we've seen a lot in Paraguay, which is where I'm based, uh, denaturalization of the universal service funds for, sur for funding surveillance and security programs throughout the country. So first, I'm quite curious to see if there are other examples, because I think Natalia in the beginning was sort of like mentioning how the USF Sometimes it's used for other purposes, but perhaps you can talk a bit more about that as well, because we're quite curious in network with, if and see if other countries also have these sort of initiatives that are quite uh, different from the purpose for what the USF was created. Particularly in Paraguay, we've seen uh, that USF funds have been used to acquire surveillance and biometric technology to be deployed in the streets of the capital and other cities. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Please just ask the question and then we'll do a collaborative answer there. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, the, the speakers, and online and offline, for such uh, interesting insights. So I have a question. Uh, I think it was Ben on capital financing. Uh, I liked the the different tiers you spoke to in terms of investment economics. And so I have a question. To what extent does uh, private and public sector financing, in each, whichever those models are, influence the costs uh, are related to entry into, into the ecosystem by our community networks? So, is there a linkage between the model of capital financing, whether it's private or public, and the barriers in, of entry for community networks? And also then a, a general question then to the whole team, because I, I have a sense that we can, and I think someone talked to it, you can get to the, the same objective, but using different uh, uh, tools. So, how can we, maybe from the experience of the community networks, is there a sort of a one-size-fits-all kind of model, or there is room for you to appreciate what is the context and listen in, especially from a public sector perspective, and see how you can plug in in a way vis-a-vis -vis highway or no way? Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, we also have a community network in India and it's called Kaumesh and it's community owned Wi-Fi mesh network. So uh, one of the things we struggle a lot is uh, how to, um, del I mean, when do the community take operational ownership and how is that possible? So with this we struggle in terms of what internet is for them. And when Sol mentioned common language, I've been thinking, for us, internet is hypertext, hyperlinks. So if you are low literate, if you don't have the text in your repertoire of possible media things, how do you do hypertext, hyperlink? Like, What is internet for these people? Are we stagnated? Are we stopping the idea of what internet is? Or can we push this to community networks on like, who are the people who can push this internet idea itself to people 
who have left before in like three billion people. So that's my, and, and maybe this connection is also about hardware, not only, but services, the idea of internet and all that. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for those great questions. And if we could do speed round on your answers uh, a minute. So Sol, over to you on Giga. Thank you, thanks Eric for the question. So how did the lowering costs happen? I have that. Um, I think essentially it's about being better informed. Um, you know, what does the internet co actually cost? Um, better access to understanding technologies in certain cases and what the options were. Um, so some of it has to do with conditions. So longer contracts, better pricing, um, as well as what you mentioned of bigger contracts, right? Uh, so demand aggregation in some way. Um, and better supported, I think, is one of the, the, the key elements. So, uh, yeah, an informed ecosystem, I would say it. And in terms of contracts, I think it's exactly to your point. It's not about making bigger contracts the whole time. But I have experienced it both now and previously as a community network, how difficult it is for public institutions to manage contracts. And they don't have just one. I mean, they, whether it's a municipality or nationally, managing hundreds and hundreds of contracts. You know, do they pay on time? Because they don't know how to manage that. So the idea here is not to exclude small operators. I think on the contrary, it's by helping to manage those contracts effectively, seeing that and linking that perhaps to the connectivity status. Okay, I can see it's connected still. Yes, you get paid. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry to cut you off. Um, Paraguay, question on denaturalization. Josefina, Natalia, Natalia, you have one minute. Well, in regards to the question on Paraguay, I actually cited the case of Asuncion specifically in the report I have mentioned. And I mean, in that case, they bought surveillance cameras with money from the Universal Service Fund, which is not a use we consider appropriate, right? And then I remember that was one of the most extreme cases we have found. However, there are other cases too in which, uh, I mean, it wasn't clear whether the impact of the use was as relevant as wanted. But I remember that the Asuncion case, that's probably the one uh, our colleague is referring to, uh, was cited specifically in the report. And well, I had more things to say, but I guess we don't have time, so. Josephine. Uh, yes, I think there's definitely reallocation of funds, uh, but the challenge also within Africa, I think GSMA is just currently um, reviewing a study on that, is that there are no clear reporting or there are no clear reports as to how the funds are spent. So yes, there's reallocation, but it's also difficult to track exactly where the money went to. Back to accountability. Okay, Ben, there was a great question on the issues you raised. Um, if you could give a minute. Yeah, just to quickly answer, it was a question about the cost of capital. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, we're in a place right now in the world where, you know, interest rates are higher than they've ever been before. So uh, we're just seeing a delay on builds across uh, uh, across the globe. And unfortunately, th that hits uh, emerging markets the hardest. What I would say to great operators, one of the key data points we look at whenever we finance any project is what we think about is kind of a maniacal focus on reducing the cost of service delivery. Um, just to give you an example, just on this panel, Teddy had mentioned how in the UK, there's a subsidy of a little over 3,000 pounds. Um, and, and part of that is just the cost to build in those markets is a lot higher. In the United States, it's even higher than that. Um, and it's because this trade-off between capital and labor um, and in markets where labor is more expensive. So what I tell all the emerging market providers, first of all, if you ever need capital, please knock on our door. Um, we're, we're, we're here to lend. Um, and uh, But it, it is that focus on uh, utilizing the services that you have, which are a lower cost of labor, to get that cost of install down. Um, and that's how you can deliver an ARPU, you know, in the 10 to $15 range, which is what we, we see as kind of the way to unlock access at, at that lower economic strata. And given that there's so much interest um, online and in the room, we may start up a listserv or a group um, based on this uh, workshop to have this continue the conversation because I know there's one about Komesh. I think that one we could take onto a list group if you, uh, an email list if you don't mind. 
um, or Slack or wherever people want to uh, set up. And I would just say that um, Teddy and Quasentino will give you 30 seconds if you want to give us a tweet um, because I want to make sure everyone got a last question in. So Quasentino, 30 seconds. Um, thanks, Jane. So the only thing that uh, I will say here is that let's have a conversation on infrastructure. Let's use what we have as tools, but let's make sure that we make them, we build them up in a way that everyone can participate and there are accountability mechanisms for not misuse and mismanagement of these funds. And Teddy? Teddy, uh, back yeah. over to you. Thanks, Jane. Uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, I didn't realize I was going to have the honor of being a closing speaker on this part, um, but I, I guess the thing I would stress is really important is um, regulators thinking about a level playing market field, a level field, a level field for the market um, for communications providers of all types. Part of that is also providing research and facts and evidence that a make the regulators decisions more robust and more understandable, but also can help others in the sector understand what are the factors at play, where is service not as good as it should be. What are ways that it can be improved? Um, and so I think that's uh, also a really important aspect to consider as we're kind of looking at a holistic image of what are the challenges we face in connecting the world. Thank you so much. I would just like to give everybody a round of applause. Thank you to the wonderful uh, panelists. You were excellent. Yay. And to Senka so much for not only the paper she helped draft uh, write, <laughs> but also the great uh, organization of this panel. So thank you all very much. This was excellent. And thank you to Carlos for being our online moderator. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Now we can't listen to you. Uh, <laughs> now, you now we can't. Well, it's OK. No, I was just going to say that I met Saul at IGF 2017. And today I learned that it's World Mental Health Day. I mean, yesterday, like the 10th of October. And I remember, I don't even remember, I guess she doesn't even remember the conversation we have, but she recommended a book called The Body Keeps the Score, which I have read and is really good. And I recommend to everybody else because today's world I'm a mental health day, so, and I saw Saul at the session, and I haven't seen her since IGF 2017, so that's why I'm reading that, thank you. <laughs>